So, all right, young scholars, I'm going to go over some of the book um, and I'm highlighting the parts I'm going to read uh, in this PDF and also um, going to give you a little clarity on the, uh, the morality questions. Those, will, those references will be highlighted in green. Um, so anyway, this is picking up after the last section, which ended with them discovering the truck full of human bodies, <coughs> which sort of implied a history where someone had... Um, I mean, I guess you could read it as if every all the humans went into the truck to sleep or something and died, but it's more likely um, that they uh, they had been captured and transported, uh, which builds out a little bit of the world that um, we're living in here. Right. So um, after the following day, they backtracked and camped in the actual road, and when they went on in the morning, the macadam had cooled. This word macadam is an oldie timey one for anyone, anyone. Very good, Loretta. Black top. It has to do with the road. Uh, by and by, they saw a set of tracks cooled in the tar. Um, just to give some context, uh, this is all because they, the following day, they traveled through a drifting haze of wood smoke and the drawers of smoke coming off the ground like mist and thick black trees and slopes of stands. Late in the day, they came to a place where the fire had crossed the road and the macadam was still warm. And further on, it began to soften underfoot. The hot black mastic sucked at their shoes and stretched in thin bands. So they, they stopped. Uh, we'll have to wait. Right, so the, the road was so hot that the, uh, uh, from the fires, right? Um, by and by, they came to see a set of tracks cooled in the tar. They just suddenly appeared. He squatted and studied them. Someone had come out of the woods in the night and continued down the melted roadway. Who is it, said the boy. I don't know. Who is anybody? They came upon him shuffling along the road before them dragging one leg slightly and stopping from time to time to stand stooped and uncertain before setting out again. What should we do, Papa? We're all right. Let's just follow and watch. Take a look, the boy said. Yes, take a look. They followed him a good ways, but at his pace were losing the day, and finally he just sat in the road and did not get up again. The boy hung on to his father's coat. No one spoke. He was as burnt looking as the country, his clothes scorched and black. One of his eyes was burnt shut and his hair was but a nitty wag, wig of ash upon his blackened skull. As they passed, he looked down, as if he'd done something wrong. His shoes were bound up with wire and coated with road tar, and he sat there in the silence, bent over his rags. The boy kept looking back. Papa, he whispered, what is wrong with the man? He's been struck by lightning. Can't we help him, Papa? No, we can't help him. The boy kept pulling at his coat. Papa, he said, stop it. Can't we get? Can't we help him, Papa? No, we can't help him. There's nothing to be done for him. They went on. The boy was crying. He kept looking back. When they got to the bottom of the hill, the man stopped and looked at him and looked back up the road. The burned man had fallen over, and at a distance, you couldn't even tell what it was. I'm sorry, he said, but we have nothing to give him. We have no way to help him. I'm sorry for what happened to him, but we can't fix it. You know, you know that, don't you? The boy stood looking down. He nodded his head. Then they went on and did not look back again. All right, so here's where the father has um, made a choice, and I should have made that green. Uh, it's going to continue a little bit later. Um, but here it's sort of, um, there are schools of ethical thought. This one is pragmatism, um, which is a, a sort of ethical code where <coughs> you um, um, help the most people uh, in the most practical way, in a pragmatic way. In this case, if the, father, the father's uh, idea was the man was going to die no matter what, so any attempt to help him would have been a waste of their time and a risk of them, um, possibly a waste of resources, which comes up here because the boy is not so um, easily convinced about it. The boy was crying and he kept looking back. Uh, in the morning, he lay looking up at the clay nests that Swallows had built in the corners under the bridge. He looked at the boy, but the boy had turned away and lay staring out at the river. There's nothing we could have done. He didn't answer. He's going to die. We can't share what we have or we'll die too. I know. So when are you going to talk to me again? I'm talking right now. Are you sure? Yes. Okay. Okay. They stood on the far shore of a river and called to him, tattered gods slouching in their rags across the waste, trekking the dried floor of a mineral sea where it lay cracked and broken like a fallen plate, paths of feral fire in the coagulate sands, the figures of faded faded in the distance. He woke and lay in the dark. Um, 
Okay, uh, now this is a strange ship. They stood on the far shore of a river and called to him, tattered gods, slouching like rags across the waist. Um, slouching is just kind of slumping along, trekking is traveling the dried floor of the mineral sea where it lay cracked and broken like a fallen plate. Paths of feral fire, something that's feral is wild and untamed. Coagulate is uh, sort of melted together. Figures faded in the distance. Well, this is a description of a dream. It has sort of imagery and tones of um, sort of like ancient Greeks with uh, dead gods in a river. Um, if you recall, the river Styx is what Greeks uh, believed you had to cross to get into Hades after death. Um, here's another one of these musings. Uh, no lists of things to be done the day, providential to itself. Uh, the hour, there is no later, this is later. All things of grace and beauty such that one holds them to one's heart to have a common providence in, man, in pain. Uh, their birth and grief and ashes. So he whispered to the sleeping boy, I have you. Basically what this stuff is talking about is there's, there's no more things that need to be done. There's just survival. Um, it's kind of like what we have now. Like, uh, the day providential to itself, meaning it only has importance to itself. Uh, there is no later. This is the later. Um, philosophically thinking about the only thing he has is, him, is his boy. He thought about the picture in the road, and he thought that he should have tried to keep her in their lives in some way, but he didn't know. He woke coughing and walked out so as not to wake the child, following a stone wall in the dark, wrapped in his blanket, kneeling in the ashes like a penitent. A penitent is someone who seeks penance for uh, forgiveness. He coughed till he could taste the blood, and he said her name aloud. He thought perhaps he'd said it in his sleep. When he got back, the boy was awake. I'm sorry, he said. Um, this is the father thinking about the mother. This should have been one of my questions about the ethics. Uh, in this case, should he have tried to keep uh, the boy, uh, the mother in uh, their lives in terms of their memory? He decided not to. He left her photograph on the, uh, where they were. All right. um, and here is something about the boy which um, describes how he's a product of the world into which he was born. Right. Always so deliberate, hardly surprised by the most outlandish advents. So in other words, the boy, very deliberate, he stays focused on what he's doing, and he's hardly surprised by outlandish advents would be the most ridiculous um, new scenarios or situations. Uh, trucks with human bodies in them uh, are things he isn't really surprised of. A creation perfectly evolved to meet its own end, uh, as if the boy has been, um, he's just made to live in this world. Um, he's adapted to it, and this world is one that's, um, things don't live long. So it's almost like the boy is perfectly evolved to deal with the fact that he will not have a long life. They sat at the window and ate in their robes by candlelight a midnight supper and watched distant cities burns. A few nights later, she gave birth in her their bed by the light of a dry cell lamp, All right? So this is after the event, um, before the boy is born, um, even though this is the, this sort of topic sentence tells us it's about the boy, this is a flashback to uh, the past while they watched the cities burn. The probable appearance of the small crown of the head, this is the birth, streaked with blood and lank black hair, the rank meconium. Her cries meant nothing to him. In other words, the, the baby, as a baby, he didn't even react to his mother's screaming. Beyond the window, just the gathering cold, the fires on the horizon. He held aloft the scrawny red body, so raw and naked, and cut the cord with kitchen shears and wrapped his son in a towel. All right, so they, um, obviously he's born as the cities are still burning right, at the, right after the event. It's almost like uh, that scene in The Lion King where he holds up the baby at the uh, end, except he's doing it in a empty house where he's just watching the cities burn. Uh, and then the boy, now we're back to the present. Did you have any friends? He's uh, The boy is asking the father. Yes, I did. Lots of them? Yes. Do you remember them? Yes, I remember them. What happened to them? They died. All of them? Yes, all of them. Do you miss them? Yes, I do. Where are we going? We're going south. Okay. So the boy, who's never had friends, um, is asking about the past. Um, and then, without missing a beat, sort of like it's described here, so deliberate and unsurprised by things, um, he asks if you miss them, I do, and then he moves directly to thinking about the future, where we headed. 
Right? They were all day on the long black road, stopping in the afternoon to eat sparingly the meager supplies. The boy took his truck from the path and shaped roads in the ash with a stick. The truck tooled along slowly. He made truck noises. The day seemed almost warm, and they slept in the leaves with their packs under their, under their heads. Something woke him. He turned on his side and lay listening. He raised his head slowly, the pistol in his hand. He looked down at the boy, and when he looked back toward the road, the first of them were already coming into view. God, he whispered. He reached and shook the boy, keeping his eyes on the road. They came shuffling through the ash, casting their hooded heads from side to side, some of them wearing canister masks, one in a biohazard suit, stained and filthy, slouching along with clubs in their hands, lengths of pipe, coughing. Then he heard on the road behind them what sounded like a diesel truck. Quick, he whispered, quick. He shoved the pistol in his belt and grabbed the boy by the hand, and he dragged the car through the trees and tilted it over where it would not so easily be seen. The boy was frozen with fear. He pulled him to him. It's all right, he said. We have to run. Don't look back. Come on. So I highlighted this in green because the threat, the reason they have clubs and lengths of pipe um, is because they're most likely cannibals. They're not going to rob them. There's nothing to steal. I mean, they could steal their supplies. Um, but there's further evidence of that here. The other thing is the father grabs the gun. And again, this is more inference than explicit. He only has one bullet. Um, there's no way he's going to take on a whole group with one bullet. So the only way is to lead to that last question of um, putting his son out of his misery before they can do anything. Right? Uh, this is where the road rat is, is there taking, uh, taking a leak. Um, and these are some of the indications of his um, what you call it, of his um, uh, cannibalism. Uh, skipping down here, my mouse barely looks. Like a like an animal inside a skull. These are his eyes. Oh, damn it. Uh, eyes colored in cups. Eyes colored in cups of grime and deeply sunk like an animal inside a skull looking out the eye holes. He wore a beard that had been cut square across the bottom with shears and he had a tattoo of a bird on his neck done by someone with an ill-formed informed, sorry, ill -formed notion of their appearance. Uh, this is one of those other things where they're, they have cult markings. They have tattoos. They shave their beards in a certain way. They belong to things. They don't just eat people. They've built a culture. They've built a gang uh, structure. Um, this is the conversation I'm assuming you understood. Uh, within it is the um, sense that he, he's asking about ammunition, and then he's asking what they're eating. Uh, again, this is also him uh, implying that whatever you can, whatever we can find, whatever you can find. Yeah, he looked at the boy. You won't shoot, he said. That's what you think. Um, you ain't got but two shells, maybe just one, and they'll hear the shot. Um, so this is when he asks about the eating, and then the, and then the man looks at the boy. Uh, that's why uh, the implication is that uh, these guys have been eating people. I'm just moving along because uh, I can only record 15 minutes. All right, and here we get some hint that the father seems to know about science, um, the science of the brain. Um, this is why the guy thinks he's a doctor. Uh, we don't know. Sort of back to that statement that the man says earlier when the kid says, who is he? And he says, who is anybody? Um, we don't know anything about the man. We don't know what his career was. Uh, we know he had, some, he had some friends. He had a wife. But that's about it. And oftentimes we define ourselves by what we do. Um, and this is just the uh, scene where um, the road rat tries to go after him with a knife. Uh, the man is big but very quick. He dove and grabbed the boy and rolled up and came up against his chest, uh, with him against his chest and the knife at his throat. <clears throat> the man was in position. He had already dropped to the ground and he swung level and fired the pistol from a two-handed position balanced on both knees at a distance of six feet. Sounds like he knows how to use a gun. Um, they managed then to run uh, for their lives, and they're hiding in the woods. And really, um, in terms of that last question, it only becomes ex a little bit more explicit on the next pages you're going to read. He held the boy's hand as they stumbled through the woods, the question about whether he should kill his child. Uh, the other hand, he held the form. You can see no worse with eyes shut. Uh, a single round left in the revolver. You will not face the truth. You will not. That's where he's contemplating it. All right, I have to stop here. Uh, I'm going to assign the reading and what's next 
um, in real life.